Well, if we look at that situation, uh, where production is not increasing, mm -hmm. um, what about countries like Russia? Russia had a very interesting second life. Uh, when the oligarchs came in, the, ru the ruble had collapsed because of the low oil prices. Then, all of a sudden, oil prices took off again, and there was a magic window of time where effectively, if they could keep all their costs in rubles, they were playing with almost $100 in oil spread. And they, could br and they brought in all this unbelievable technology from Schlumberger and Baker Hughes, and so forth, and they went back and aggressively tapped up all the pockets of oil left behind and created a second life. And now the second life is over, and Russia is in probably irreversible decline. And you're going to watch the hard-nosed Russians take very careful measure to make sure that they don't ever again overproduce these fields. One of the reasons they're asking the major oil companies to politely leave town mm -hmm. is that they didn't want, don't want anybody screwing with their precious reserves. Isn't it also true that countries operate differently than the United States does as to their oil production or natural gas production? Is it well, truly a free market? We're, we're the only significant producer of oil and, and natural gas that have basically a total free market. It's a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have, the major oil companies don't play a, a significant role in the E&P in the e business in, in the United States. It's really all the independents. We have thousands of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that none of them are coordinated. So it's just a big free market, you know, kind of producing a little here and a little there and a little there and a little there. Uh, whereas most of the other major oil producers have a national oil company that basically is in control of all of it. Mm -hmm. And they're actually looking out, not for our, us as consumers, they're looking out for them as a key country that their only asset is oil. Same here, or grillings, as you would point out. Um, I think it was pointed out to the senators mm -hmm. uh, that the IOCs, the international oil companies, the big guys in our ne neck of the woods, mm -hmm. are controlling less than 6% of the reserves globally. Yeah. Uh, and they really don't have the ability to change the price. Yeah, yeah. Would it be safe to say that even if they wanted to provide low-cost oil to the United States, they don't have it to provide? That's, that's what surprises me, is how often I hear the major oil company senior leadership talk about the fact that these current oil prices are temporary and will come down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, rest assured they'll come down. As I said, why would you do that when you have zero control over that? Mm -hmm. uh, I just, I, I don't get it. They're just asking. You know, I, I remember, I can't remember which Thanksgiving it was. It was, I think, that Thanksgiving of 2005 when the Senate Energy Committee first convened and grilled big oil, raked them over the coals, I think was the term that the papers used. Mm -hmm. And I watched on television that night, and then I read the New York Times the next day, and I saw all five of them with their hands up, and they all five basically said, these current prices won't last. Well, they were right. <laughs> they're going to go up. Uh, they're going to go up, but they said, I think prices may maybe $45 a barrel at the time. So maybe it was Thanksgiving 2004. Mm -hmm. And they basically said, you know, this is temporary. They're going to go down to a hundred, uh, they're going to, to twenty-seven, and now it looks like they just forgot to put a hundred and twenty-seven. If we look at these particular situations, we got a high price of crude. Uh, we have high price gasoline. We're having trouble. That we have, we have sticker shock price gasoline, or it's right price. That's not right yet. So you think it will go higher? It has to. Okay. Let's say it continues to run. Mm -hmm. 97% of our transportation runs on the hydrocarbon. Yeah. Is there anything... Runs on oil. Runs on oil. Yeah. Um, is there anything this country can be doing at this point yeah. to secure transportation? Uh, yeah, we can travel less. As individuals? Mm-hmm. Okay. That will certainly reduce demand. We can put some... We're going to have to, because if supply shrinks, then we have to figure out a very fast way for demand to shrink so we can create a cushion so we don't run out of gasoline and run out of diesel. Then it would be a great American nightmare. And we'd also, therefore, run out of food, which would be a travesty. Mm -hmm. We cannot anymore enjoy the luxury that we created over the last post, ever since the World War II, because we were building it on a phony concept that energy prices would be abundant forever and cheap forever. And now I watch all of these, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, for people seemingly sobbing on the nightly news that, oh my gosh, I just can't believe that it's not free anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't say free anymore. They say it's so unbelievably high. Well, looking on the consumption side, let's say we can rework things and start to pay for our transportation at a rate that's fair for the value that you're getting. Mm -hmm. And we do start to see a reduction in increased consumption. We're going we're to have to force that. Let's say we do it. Yeah. Isn't it just as likely that any, any reduction we would have would be soaked up by an increase in, say, China or India? Oh, absolutely. That's one of the reasons that we need to very quickly organize a crisis summit and help China and India design a plan to grow without being so unbelievably you know, copying our fuel inefficiency. I had a lovely talk at a, at a program in Boston a couple of weeks ago with the chairman of Tata. Uh, and he told me about their unbelievable $2,400 car they're building. Mm -hmm. That will get the early models will get about 65 miles per gallon. They think they can get that up to 100 miles per gallon for $2,400. Now that's that's the sort of future of the cars we need to be building. Now we've been talking about transportation. Let's switch the conversation a little bit and talk about our power base. Mm -hmm. In the United States, I think 51, 52 percent of our power comes from coal. Mm -hmm. um, in the high or mid 20s, 26, 27 percent is natural gas. Yeah, I, closer to 20, I believe. 20 percent. There's a portion that's nuclear. 20, 20 nuclear. I always think I think natural gas and nuclear are about the same, but you know, why quit? You know, it, you're in the ballpark. And a very small percentage is renewables. Well, you've got you've got first of all coal 50. Let's just round the coal 50, nuclear 20. That's 70. Natural gas, 20, that's 90. Mm -hmm. Hydro, 7. Mm -hmm. So you're 97. Okay. Geothermal, 1.5. Okay. So you've got 1.5% that's wind and solar. Okay, so it's a very small percentage. Well, 1.5%. Mm -hmm. But it's a big number. It is a big it's number. It's 1.5%. We've had so much focus on this 1.5%, 2%, 7% wind for Texas. Yeah. Uh, but almost no focus on large... Um, coal-fired plants or on any kind of power base for the United States. Yeah, because we didn't like their carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. um, is there any strategy to provide power uh, for even this country, which of course is the top of the food chain as far as countries are concerned? Well, there's, yeah, there's a strategy that we need power. Generated how? We don't, have, we don't have any implementation. See, you can have a great strategy and fail to have an implementation plan. So I think the United States has a first-rate strategy. We just failed to come up with a game plan. Are there any strategies that our environmental lobbyists would accept? Any game plans? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, but still... The yeah, we have a big problem coming up this summer, by the way. I was hearing about it when I was visiting the Permian Basin. Because we couldn't go ahead and build the coal-fired plants that were on the drawing board because the Greens said no. Right. Uh, we now have the ERCOT, that's what we call our internal market for electricity, right against, right against the bubble. Mm -hmm. What some of the oil producers in the Permian Basin are very quite nervous about is a ten, five to ten day prolonged heat wave, baking heat, where seven percent of our electricity comes from wind. In baking heat, there is no wind. Mm -hmm. And so that will mean a huge rationing of getting people off the grid or we'll have a blackout. And they said, if we had a blackout, uh, it would probably be one that would last quite a while. And as the blackout happens, we shut down our stripper well production. And, and also our service stations would shut down because mm -hmm. without electricity, can't pump the gas. Can't pump the gas. And so that would be a Pearl Harbor event for the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. I was hearing this three weeks ago. I thought, wow, I had no idea. I. We wasn't paying attention, but I do remember all the lawsuits that kept the power plants from being built. Right. So the unforeseen consequences of one thing led to the unforeseen consequences of another, and now at risk are our gasoline stations and our stripper wells in a blackout. 